He doesn't make the Sherman, you know, speech, but um, pretty close. That's the way he thought. And of course, in his view, campaigning for office was an act of prostitution. I'm sorry, Mr. Congressman, but you know. <laughs> um, um, obviously, things are different today. Um, for better and for worse and whatever. Um, anyway, they do get him. He goes. He doesn't say anything until the last day. And he says, oh, by the way, instead of a district of 40,000, I think it should be reduced to 30,000. And they say, they've been arguing about this for months. He, they say, okay, okay, whatever you want. You know, like, but that's what you want. And then he sits out the ratification, although he writes secretly to, anyway, it happens. One of the interesting things about his presidency, if you read the, the correspondence, and one of the things I've left out because for time reasons, his whole interest in the Potomac. When he comes back from the war, one of his projects is to build what be is the backside of Mount Vernon, the piazza. It wasn't there before. What does he see when he looks out there? The Potomac. Washington is one of those people, and Jefferson is another, who thinks the Potomac is the entry to the West. That it somehow we can navigate up the Potomac, make some, some changes, a few canals. We can get the Potomac to connect to the Ohio, and the Ohio connects to the Mississippi. This is the gateway to the West. Alexandria, Virginia is going to be the biggest port in North America. He thinks that. It doesn't happen that way. But they spend a lot of, if you just look at the correspondence in the 1780s, all this stuff on the Potomac. Huge, huge thing. Now, here again, remember, he's got 37,000 acres out there. If you settle, it goes up. His motives are not completely pure. Nevertheless, his vision is of a way inland through the, by water through Virginia. What ends up being the way? It's the Erie Canal. It's, there really isn't, everybody thinks there's got to be a waterway. There really isn't. You can create a canal to connect the Great Lakes across. It's the same way of thinking that Jefferson has. Um, Lewis and Clark is looking for the river across the continent. God would not make a continent without a river that crosses it. <laughs> Actually, he also thinks there's dinosaurs out there. And, um, of course, there is no way across the continent, just as the, the Potomac doesn't get to the Ohio. But it's part of his thinking. All great men have fantasies like this, and this is, this is his. Okay. Um, I need to, to conclude here because I need to give you some time to ask some questions. With regard to whether Washington should be taken off the quarter, and apparently that's a serious thing going on here, and I don't think it would necessarily, you know, Western civilization will not crumble if this happens, but there are two great founding moments in American history. When we declare independence and acquire the West, and the other when we declare nationhood and manage an empire. Washington is the central figure in both foundings. There's almost nobody else in American history about whom you could say, we wouldn't be sitting here. Now, later in life, Adams was asked this, and said, what would have happened if Washington got killed in the war? What would have happened if, you know, blah, blah, blah. And Adams always said, we just found another Washington. <laughs> there wasn't one that had his prestige. And I'm not a person that believes great men make history. Most of the time, history makes great men. And it happened both ways for Washington. But if you're going to take anybody off any money, this is the guy you don't want to pick, okay? All right, and to return to our Western theme in a somewhat more cogent way. Um, oh, well, let me add this thought. 
I've been talking, I just talked in terms of foundings. What makes the American Revolution a revolution? Interesting. Is the secession from the British Empire and a war for colonial, a successful war for colonial independence a revolution? No. No. There's plenty of those happening in Latin America and Africa and all over the place afterwards. They're not called revolutions. The definition of revolution has been established mostly on European terms, mostly with the French Revolution as the model. And it's basically a Marxist model. It's the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, the Chinese Revolution. And essentially, it, must, it is one class must replace another class. If that's, the, if that's the definition, the American Revolution doesn't qualify as a revolution, because that's not what happens. The same leaders present in 75 or present in 1800, if they're still alive. Most of them. What makes it a revolution, I think, and I have some support on this from Hannah Arendt, the revolution begins as a war for independence, but it continues and culminates with the creation of the first large republic nation-sized republic that becomes the model for the liberal state in the modern world and proceeds to defeat the monarchies of Europe in the 19th century, the fascist, Nazi, and J Japanese totalitarianisms, and then the Soviet communism by 1990. And now, I mean, if you're looking for a model it's going to be some form of representative government based on the principle of popular sovereignty and some form of market capitalism, either regulated or controlled by the government. That's it. Now, they don't call it capitalism back in the 18th century, and they don't call it democracy either, but that's essentially what, what is, going to, is being created. And in, it is the culmination of that in the creation of the American Republic, or the American Constitution in 1787. And Washington just as he saw where history was headed in 75 and knew we were going to war, he sees where history is headed in 87, 88. We're going to become a great imperial power. All right. Um, let me go back to where we started, the circular letter, um, and call attention to the two features that I think we're more prepared to fully appreciate. The first is that Providence, with an earthly assist from John Jay, had presented the infant American Republic with an exceptional, historically unprecedented cluster of conditions, isolated from Europe, uh, European predators by a vast ocean, possessed of a nearly boundless continent that just happened to contain the most fertile land on the planet, blissfully bereft of those feudal and medieval institutions that clotted the arteries of older civilizations, what we have here, then, is the original articulation of American exceptionalism. And the point to notice is that for Washington, it meant exactly the opposite of what it means to most people today. Proponents of American exceptionalism nowadays are almost always advocating the projection of America's unique combination of political and economic values abroad usually labeled as democracy and capitalism, um, to all parts of the world because they're universal principles that we just happen to be the first people to discover. Washington's formulation, formulation emphasizes the truly unique geographic, political, demographic, and historical conditions that permitted these American ideas to flourish, thereby um, carrying the clear implication that one should not expect these values to take seed and grow elsewhere very easily, if at all, certainly not in the sands of the Middle East. Precisely because our experience was exceptional, our modern version of American exceptionalism is, in his view, exceptionally misguided. Finally, we need to notice that Washington's inspirational view of America's Western vistas conveniently airbrushed Native Americans from the picture. 
Knowing what we do about Washington's youthful experience, it is impossible to argue that he did not know that those fertile plains and valleys were already occupied by about 80,000 long-standing inhabitants who had been there on average of 600 years. No prominent American uh, of, the, of his generation, of the revolutionary generation, had more direct experience with and exposure to the Native American people um, west of the Alleghenies than Washington. What was to become of these people then was obviously an important piece of unfinished business that could not be conveniently obscured for long and that posed a huge and moral problem for anyone who took revolutionary principles seriously. Jefferson coined a phrase, it's, you see it, Gordon Wood wrote a whole book with this as it said, Empire of Liberty. Empire of Liberty. Well, and that's what they were trying to do by not having colonies. But could it be an empire of liberty and be compatible with genocide? To put it squarely, could Native Americans be folded into the new American empire as equal members, just as the states were going to be in, folded in as equal members? To his credit, Washington grasped the moral and political issues at stake in that question. He did not dodge it. How he answered it and why he failed will be the focus of our last lecture. Thank you very much. I'm told I can take two questions. <laughs> I'm going to, uh, Eric, my son, Juan, and then uh, my uh, uh, former student right over here, then that'll be really easy. Yes, sir. You got a hand up and you got the mic, too. I did. I, mean, I can't I, stop I took you. it all. <laughs> um, interesting, the byplay between Washington and Madison, but how did Madison really convince Washington to go to Philadelphia? How did Madison really convince Washington to do this? Two things. He had a no Washington, Madison was really good at counting noses. That's like what most politicians now do. And Virginia gentlemen of the 18th century usually didn't find that very attractive. He was really good at it. He told Washington that it was clear that the people opposing any central any change in the Articles were boycotting the convention. Therefore, the convention would be comprised of moderates and radicals, those who wanted some reform and those who wanted root and branch, root and branch change. Therefore, we had a shot. The numbers said we had a shot. The second, when Washington extracted this from him as a promise, he said, I'm trying to decide whether to do this. My reputation is important to me. My legacy is important to me. You must promise me that we go for broke. We don't go halfway. We don't compromise. We're going for a complete switch of sovereignty from the state to the federal level. And Madison said, OK. And that's what the Virginia plan says that he wrote. The reason he wrote it, because that's the only way to get Washington, okay? And they couldn't deliver on it. Um, but that's an answer to your question. I'm only allowed to take one more. I should get somebody in the back. Is there anybody? Yes, sir. They, let them get this to you. I mean. Uh, Uh, we learned in your first lecture how very ambitious Washington was. So in light of that, my question is, did he really want to go back under his vine and tri fig tree? Yeah, or I was know. that more of a pose because he thought it would be unseemly to reveal his ambition? For a guy that's as straight ahead as Washington is, and when you read his writing, sometimes you're boring. <laughs> He is, on this question, the most psychologically complicated person I've ever studied. That is to say, 
He can never accept power unless he is absolutely convinced that he has rejected it. <laughs> That's what he does in the Continental Congress when they offer him head of the Continental Army. I don't want it. I don't deserve it. Please don't give it to me. Boom. Now, you can do your amateur Freudian analysis of that and say, bubbling away in his uh, subconscious mind is these, are these ambitious energies. Okay, prove it. You can't. And I think his, that he's, he's torn. He's legitimately torn. He is very ambitious. But on this particular issue, that is to say whether he should go on into the convention and then be the presidency, there are too many letters to his best friends saying, I feel like a prisoner going to jail. Martha doesn't want him to do it. And again, I know this will only mark me as an anachronism, but <laughs> that's okay. Think about it. Who in his or her right mind at this moment would run for the presidency of the United States? <laughs> you have to be nuts. <laughs> You have to be willing to surrender your whole life for all the rest of your life and the privacy of your family, and you know you're going to take a look at Obama's hair. <laughs> you're going to not live as long. And you're probably going to end up being the butt of all kinds of hostile opinion. Okay? Now, Washington doesn't fit that. But I think our presumption that political ambition is there in, in a kind of bubbling way in those people. It really wasn't. It really wasn't. And in his case, I think the Continental Army, you could make a case, you know, okay. Though he also knew he was telling the truth. I don't know how to run an army. He's head, he, the, as soon as he gets appointed head of the army, he writes to his friends in Cambridge and says, send me all the books you know on how to run an army. <laughs> He really doesn't know how to do it. So that I think that I read it as legitimate. There is the ambition, to be sure. But, and that's, 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 that's there. But I, I think it's mis misleading to say he's being coy. He's being disingenuous. If he's being disingenuous, he's really fooling himself, too. His, 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 his reluctance, I am absolutely convinced, is psychologically and emotionally authentic. We can't end on that note. Take, yeah, we, that's too. That's too. Too negative. One more. One. One brief one. Yes, sir. Any single event that turned Madison away from Washington. Ah. Was there any single event that turned Madison against Washington? He is referring to the fact that Madison makes one of the most dramatic 180 degree switches in 1789, 1790, 91. He goes from being an ultra-nationalist to being the vo voice for Jeffersonian states' rights republicanism. He does. And he would say, he really didn't change. Somehow, if they admit he changed, he's inconsistent and that's bad. He said, what? Of course he changed. He switched completely. Um, and what I, the, ex the, the specific explanation is, he gets elected to the House from a, a district in Virginia that is very, very opposed to federal power. And in that sense, he has, I have to represent my constituency. That's, I, don't, I agree with you. Uh, there's another partial explanation. Excuse me. Jefferson comes back from Paris. Madison kneels down at the, at the foot of his great leader, and Jefferson tells him what to do. There's some truth to that. The other, all of a sudden, this thing called the bank gets created. That's not what I was thinking of when I talked about the federal government. You know, in Virginia, they think of banks as places where you send the money so that it disappears. <laughs> they don't. There's no banks in, in Virginia. They don't have any banks. And um, and um, uh, and so the agrarian interest is going to be misrepresented and all this kind of. Final explanation, if you really study Madison's mind, the way his thinking functions, Madison is like 
a lawyer. He's a hired mind. He, give me my client, and I will represent that client, or give me the person I'm going to prosecute, and I will prosecute. And he goes in, in 1786, he says, my, my goal is, my, my client is a new, fully empowered federal government. And I got it then, okay, now I know that. I can develop my arguments. I got this Federalist 10 argument about big republics. I got all things going for me. And then he switches, and then he becomes the lawyer for the other side. And if you think about it, that's what lawyers are supposed to do, right? Represent their clients. And it's interesting because he never was trained as a lawyer, I mean, as Jefferson was and as Adams was. But that, then the question becomes, well, who decides what your client is? And that, so that leaves me back to Jefferson again. I don't know. In American history, and he switches again in 1828. Because in 1828, Calhoun and um, Fitzhugh and other Southerners are arguing that Madison and Jefferson and the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions basically justified um, the right for a state to nullify a federal uh, law, the nullification crisis. And Madison says, well, that's not quite what we were saying, you know. With, it, if the question ever becomes, well, if you move all these people up to 1861, you know, how would Washington go? How would Jefferson go? Very clear. Washington's with the Union. Very clear. Jefferson's with the Confederacy. Madison, I haven't the faintest idea. <laughs> Thank you very much.